tech increasingly helps us make smarter decisions in the city, from tracking our steps to finding the fastest route on the underground. But there are still a lot of things we can't control, from traffic jams and delays in the tube, to not being able to get a phone signal and poor air quality. So what if living in a smart city could address these issues? Today I'm joined by Kelly Borman, RSM UK's Head of Construction, to ask if this is our future and what foundations we need today to build these cities in the future. Hi Kelly. Hi Ben, great to be here today. As our Head of Construction, let me ask you one question. What's your favourite building? Ooh. I guess if I look across the globe, there's a number of buildings that I've seen over the years, some smart. Um, I would probably say The Edge in Amsterdam is one of my favourite ones. Um, it's eight to six million dollars to, to to build, but it is a fully smart corporate office. So it knows its employees' activity. It sets the car parking. It books the desks. It changes the light, the heating. It generates energy back. It generates water from its own, its own building as well. So I think that's a very, very clever building. And then the Alliance Arena um, called The Boot. I um, believe that's Munich off memory. Um, and that's got um, millions of different light effects. So it actually changes colour and light effects to blend in with the environment, time of day, people visiting, um, sunset, sunrise. It's, it's a phenomenal building to see. I suppose that's one of the beauties of being in construction, that you can see what mm -hmm. things look like and take a lot of joy from thinking about how things were built and how they compare, you know, through the decades that they're constructed. Oh, absolutely, yeah. What is a smart city? I think if you take a smart city and really turn it back around and say, you know, when we look at our smartphones and the equipment that we use, what makes our life easier? So from my point of view, a smart city is really about understanding the user, understanding the activity and just making their life a pleasant place to be, home, work, transport, anything that they need to facilitate um, throughout the day. So for me, a smart city understands that user. One thing that helps me visualise is thinking how it affects me. So if I was to come into a smart city, how would it feel different? So I think if you if you break that down around what you know, what does the user want? Why is it smart? It's about knowledge and understanding you, understanding how each part of your day is affected by certain consumer points, certain activity, transport, etc. Um, predicting that, but also making it possible. So kind of like the AI thinks for you, predicts for you, but also the buildings that you're coming into or places that you're passing through knows what you're doing and why you're doing it. That, I guess, is then multiplied by the number of people crossing over and doing that across the different assets, which then becomes a smart asset because it's reading all of that data together. Um, so for you, for example, say you need to get into the office for a certain time, you know, you, your transport's booked, um, you know, a week ahead, people know what you're going to do because it's in your your diary log or however you log it. That's booked for you. You have a coffee waiting for you. Um the building knows that you're going to come into the building at a certain time so it can give notifications. It can allocate a desk for you before you actually get into the building based on the number of people coming in, based on your team members who are in so that it knows who you want to sit with, who you're working with for the day, etc. And then on your return home, it's kind of predicting your travel time, the best time to travel. It might move your diary around for you. Um, and then you get home and you're you know, your house has got the right heating on. It's got um, your favourite podcast on the loop that's playing away in the background for us. Um, and it's basically looking at everything that you need. Your shopping's being delivered. Um, that's smart. So it's it's making your life easy. A little bit like with our phones. Um, you know, decades ago, we didn't think we'd live our lives on our phones, but they just make our lives easy now. That for me is a smart city, smart buildings and kind of smart data and management. So a smart city would know if we were both going to be in London today, it, the office would book as a desk so we sat opposite each other and when we arrive our coffees are there yep. and then we can have a lovely time uh, absolutely okay so we're talking about buildings and construction but actually we're talking about a lot of data here aren't you mm -hmm. like um to do it we need a huge amount of data mm -hmm. so you know where does that data come from that smart cities need the data comes from you and i we have our consumer spend on our phones, we have our, our footfall and our movement on our phones. Um, buildings, so the assets or tube, train, car, whatever it be, will clock our points in time and where we are and what we're doing at that point in time. Buildings will then look at everybody who's in there, the occupancy. So not it's not just about the user as well, I guess. The other thing is, is, is what's it creating from a sustainability point of view? 
uh, energy. Um, we look at some of the buildings that we're seeing now. There's one um, in the, the Middle East that will actually take condensation and regenerate it into water um, for the building. So again, it's not just the data, it's the assets actually being smart in what they're doing to actually create energy effect as well as, as making it better for the user. So we talk about the user and I get it. It makes sense to me. So as a user, my life is better if you know, more convenient. Um, you touched on energy there and emissions. And I saw a report that said 90% of emissions could be cut by 2050 just due to smart cities. Mm. So how does that happen? Like, How does a smart city cut emissions and help the planet? I guess if it can see where the biggest costs fall around. So, you know, if energy, if there's a certain weather forecast or... You know, if you if you look at again, there's there's buildings across the world where it controls temperature automatically in a building, and it will bring temperature down um, on the hottest days of the year. Um, if we know that that's forecast, and there's going to be eight hundred people in a building, but bringing that down to four hundred actually helps from an energy efficient point of view. It can then predict who's needed in that building or could they work from home that day? Is there alternative ways to actually keep that energy cost down? Mm. Um, that's one example, I guess. Are there any other benefits as well as planet? Being able to understand maintenance, mm. um, being able to understand um, labour requirements to kind of maintain and keep buildings running, um, being able to sell back energy to the grid. We all know that's going to be a challenge in the future as well around um, how energy is um, purchased and sold back to the grid when it's used. Um, so it's not it's not just about carbon and green. It's about really getting the most out of an asset um, and cost savings. So for, for the landlord um, and the occupancy, um, that it's going to be better for them if they can be more cost effective too. And do we have these anywhere in the world? Like, is anybody really pioneering smart cities? Like, There's So we've got, obviously, Bill Gates made a lot of noise, um, 2017, 18, about creating a, a full smart city um, in Arizona, in the middle of the desert, 25,000 acres, 80,000 population. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about that and funding. I think that's very different, creating a brand new smart city to repurposing the cities that we've got. But we are seeing in the UK, I think London, Manchester, Cambridge, I think Bristol as well, that's, they've all been named as becoming smart in some of the actions. A lot of that's transport management and energy um, rather than buildings as such. Um, and we do have some buildings overseas um, which are deemed to be smart buildings. So we're building it like piecemeal. We don't have to just achieve it all in one big go then it sounds like there's a journey to to get us there there's absolutely a journey to get us there i think we can't just create a smart city in the in the middle of the desert desert outside of each kind of city to to, to rebuild a whole city if you like but i think it, it's a journey mm. um i think there's also a tension around the cost to actually make um this journey as well and and where does that fall there are benefits and there will be benefits from the user the landlords um, the local authorities, energy, etc. But who's going to really take um, the cost for um, implementing these um, and building these smart cities? Is it easy just to build a new one or to repurpose what we have? Because all in cities, aren't we? And Bill Gates is talking about this enormous site in Arizona. What's easiest? Or is that just an impossible question? It's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I'll break it down. I guess mm. um, creating a smart city, I think... If the funding's there, it would be easier because you start, everything is smart from the ground, from from the minute that um, you put the groundwork in right the way to the end, airspace, movement, etc. So everything can be smart and that will create maximum efficiency. Um, and as it's planned, you can see the benefits that come out from each component. So that's an ideal world as such. We can't drop in smart cities to replace the likes of London, Manchester, Birmingham, Nottingham, wherever. So I think the repurposing, one of the biggest challenges is a lot of the buildings, and these may be kind of grey belts, and they might be old car parks or whatever they be to repurpose. How do you truly repurpose them um, to be smart? Um, are we going to put things on top of them, inside them to make them smart, or are we going to demolish them and start again? And that's a, a big challenge around, again, cost, carbon, efficiency of delivery, um, and what people want to design as well, or what's going to be purchased. In, in construction, your industry, is this talked about as something which is a huge market? Are we early, whereabouts are you know, leaders in business and construction? Where is it on the radar for, for them? It's on the radar. Mm. Um, when we think about the potential and how quick this could move 
you'd expect it to be quite high up as an opportunity. However, there's a very much a realistic view that this can't all be done at once. And again, the funding comes back as being being an issue around that. I guess one thing we are seeing is around the facilities management. So and using data in a building effectively to bring value to the asset and therefore a better lease value. So it's it's attractive. So I think facilities management have are starting to lead the way in that to try and look at how they get smart data out of buildings and you know, better maintain and run those buildings for the owners and the asset management teams. So Kelly, um, this global smart building market is projected to grow from $80 billion today to $328 billion by 2029, which is not that far away, is it? Mm. We've talked about these enormous gains in like efficiencies and emissions. Um, why aren't we doing it today? Like, why is it not top of government agenda? We're all doing it and we're seeing all these wonderful buildings getting thrown up around us. I think when you break that down, you have to think about those buildings. Um, yes, we're seeing new builds happen, but we're seeing more repurposing. So as I said before, just kind of how do we make them smart is a challenge i think the other thing is if we look at the construction industry they're struggling at the moment to deliver the projects that they've got there's still some uncertainty around those projects and kind of the spend uh, mobilization of those projects so it's a little bit about yes we know we need to do that and we know these assets will be so much better for the environment for the user but they cost so much more so how can we factor that in and you know government want access to data they want smart cities but effectively that funding and that certainty around the investment in those cities needs needs to be seen so there is a hesitation i think there's also you know a misunderstanding around tech H how do we put all this tech in mm. um you know where do we invest first because there is so much that can be used um to deliver things differently and to read data differently and to access data simply um so where do we start it's almost this, this big jumble of everything so where, where do we act what do we pick off first and how do we fund it that's that's the biggest challenge and, and where does that funding come from is it is it state funded is it private equity backed is it where where do we find the money i suppose well i think when you look at um overseas if if we if we glance across to the middle east if we look into europe etc there's a lot of tech that's being used here um across in china as well there's an open market and again this is a challenge for the uk but could actually stimulate too there's an opportunity for that investment to come inbound to stimulate this market the challenge then being as to what is repurposed as i said what is built um and where's our workforce coming from to actually deliver this? Um, so yes, I think there'll be inbound investment coming in to stimulate this. I think that's a huge target for 2029. Um, our 360 real estate survey um, did bring up 38% that a barrier was access to technology. So I think when we look at companies, they're still trying to understand the tech, never mind think about how they implement and what the asset is the other side. And you mentioned workforce there. Mm -hmm. Are we still seeing a deficit of construction workforce or are you projecting a deficit? So tech will help. Mm. So it's, it's again, it's, it's, it's a challenge because it will help the labour shortage. We need another 250,000 workforce to stand still. And you look at the growth aspirations. You look at the age profile as well. Um, I think, you know, average age is over 50 in construction. We also look at techs, techs exciting. So if you're at college, university, whatever, and you're thinking, where do I want to go? Tech's going to draw you into a business. So the old skills of construction, there's an opportunity to bring some tech into that industry and attract new skills and labor. Um, so yes, a huge issue. Tech will help, but there's a nervousness around bringing it in because of how things are being delivered, the age profile. Um, and just, I guess, construction not always been seen as an exciting industry to come into. So it's a shortfall of people mm -hmm. and a potential or actual skills gap. Yeah. Can the government do anything to address that? Like, what do we want to see? I mean, the, the government are looking at kind of the new skills agencies and how they bring people into the industry, um, how they attract um, development of technology in the industry. I think in answer, I, I'd love to say, yes, we're going to click our fingers and we get all the, get this labour in. We're not. We need overseas labour. We need new tech companies to come in and, and, I guess, disrupt in a positive way the industry to think about things, doing things differently. Um, 
I think government have to look at the projects, have to look at how they're pricing that we need to look at over here when we've got public buildings going up and, and government backed buildings. There's got to be some bridge of that um that kind of gap in technology cost somewhere. Mm. And you mentioned, like we talked about the data we need to build this and artificial intelligence. Mm. Do you think the prominence of chat GPT that led to kind of us all thinking about artificial intelligence and how we use it, has that changed the way that the construction industry looks at technology and data mm. in your over the last three years? Yeah, I mean, we've seen some great examples where, you know, AI and Gen AI will effectively read documents, look at procuring through the supply chain you know doing best pricing models learning from previous contracts um one of the challenges we don't have standardized contracts a lot of the times you know and when i say that i mean there's in the contract delivery so the asset that's being built isn't standard asset um so everything's a little bit different but what we are finding is the text reading understanding pulling out best practice pulling out risk areas that's being implemented that, however, comes with the caveat around data privacy. And, you know, a lot of this is sensitive to um, the end user of that that building or um, to the construction company that is ahead with the design. So, again, there's a lot being talked about now how we protect that data um, and a nervousness to the likes of ChatGP just pushing in information that effectively kind of gives away people's blueprint on how they're delivering things. Mm. Um, so it is being used, not to the extreme it, it should be, but there's a nervousness still yeah and to me like a huge barrier seems to be that to live in a smart city means to give over a lot of information about mm -hmm. how i enjoy living or want to live my life mm -hmm. so the the, the trade-off is i'm giving that information away for a more convenient lifestyle and indeed the other benefits and that touches on a broader end of track that's that's the debate isn't it mm -hmm. which is um it's all come into focus and i'm just i'm just curious if um the rise of how we talk about AI in day-to-day -day life has affected the construction industry and brought smart city further up the agenda, or if actually um, it's just seen as another technology that can be used. I think it has brought it up the agenda. I think it comes back to quite a traditional industry saying, but how do we change? Mm. How do we get out of this huge supply chain, this labor deficit? How do we use tech? And how do we spend and get the right tech in? And I think that's that's the challenge. So it's seen, we can see the benefits, the use of AI to to look at data and operational site management, et cetera, is coming in and is being used. And that is helping with efficiencies and risk management, things like building safety, health and safety. It can predict, it can look at where sites are risky. It can send in technology to look at something, a bot to look in an area that's dangerous for a human. So there's little pieces that are being put in the bit that we're not going to see is a, a rapid transformation where all of a sudden we have lots of smart buildings going up. It is going to be the traffic management, the energy control, certain assets being put up and then gradually learning from that as we go through on the cities. Great. Well, thanks, Kelly. But I know so much more about smart cities now and I look forward to a future where um, our desk will be put for us to sit next to each other next time we come to London. With a nice coffee too. What a great thought to end on. So thank you, Kelly, for joining us today. Subscribe today to ensure you don't miss our next Talking Tech episode. And in the meantime, you can find out more from our website linked in the show notes. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.